Okay, hello everybody. It's 10 o'clock, so I think we'll make a start if you're all ready. Uh, so hello and welcome to this webinar, Collaborating with the AEC Collection. So this session is all about understanding all the different coordinate systems in the different disciplines in the AEC Collection. Uh, before we start, can I just check that you can all hear me? So if you can hear me, oh, hands are being raised already. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, if you can uh, hear me, raise your hand on the application. Obviously, if you can't hear me, turn your speakers on or, or put the headset on or something. Okay, I can see lots of hands, so that's good. We'll, uh, we'll crack on. Uh, let me just lower all your hands. Okay, so my name's Ian Robinson and I'm the infrastructure consultant here at Greytech. So I'm based in the UK and I help customers get the most out of their infrastructure design and BIM related software. So that includes things like consultancy in the main and training as well. Um, I do a bit of support, but also webinars like this one, workshops, blogs, customer presentations. Generally, I just evangelize the technology uh, and make it work in the real world. My main focus is on Civil 3D, Map 3D, with GIS being my background, and Infoworks, Recap for Point Clouds, and Navisworks for Federated Models, and Clash Detection, and also BIM 360 as well. I work for Greytech, and Greytech are a well-established com company. Uh, we've been in business over 30 years. In fact, some of my colleagues have been working with AutoCAD for 35 years, which is quite incredible. Uh, we've established ourselves as one of the largest partners of Autodesk in the world. Uh, and this added with our own products developed in-house that uniquely places in your marketplace, the one you work in. Uh, we've got over 100 staff just in our research and development center working on the class leading BIM solutions that we provide. And we've also got 200 industry consultants, just like myself. Our products are using hundreds of thousands of projects every year uh, we've got a good support record of an 88% satisfaction on over 50,000 cases. And on top of that, we deliver over 3,500 courses per year. And there are four pillars to what we do here at Grey Tech. We create, simulate, fabricate and manage. So we work with the Autodesk portfolio and also our own power pack enhancements to aid the creation of construction and manufacturing deliverables. And then we combine that with our simulation products and that verifies the deliverables, which enables us to drive them into the fabrication process. And we also uh, have software to manage them deliverables. We also have our document management software, which links to internal and external uh, common data environment platforms as well. Now this webinar is firmly in the create phase of the project with products such as Civil 3D, Revit, AutoCAD, Infoworks, Navisworks, things like that. This is the third in this round of workshops and webinars. If you missed an introduction to Civil 3D over the past two weeks, you can now see that on the on-demand portal. Uh, this week, I'm going to be doing a, a repeat of the workshop I did last month, but cut down to one hour, uh, basically because I've been asked to do it by a few people, so it's online uh, for the future. So hopefully you'll find it useful. Next week, again by request, and the last one before we break up before Christmas, I'm looking at super elevation and how we achieve that in Civil 3D. Um, so uh, keep your eye on the events page of our website for all future events. This is a clickable link, by the way. If you go to the handout area of the GoTo software, I've given you a PDF of this presentation and you can click on them links. For past events, visit the on-demand page of our website. Again, that's a clickable link. You don't have to write down this this web address here, just, just download the presentation and you can click on it and go straight to uh, our on-demand area. While you're on our website, don't forget to subscribe to our blog. In here, you'll see important updates, useful tips and tricks and things like that. If you want a little bit more than this, then we do offer this uh, training passport. It's a single fee that allows you to attend an unlimited amount of training courses throughout the year. So if you want to attend a Civil 3D course and also a Navisworks course, or maybe an AutoCAD and a Revit course, or, or a combination of all four, then you can, all with a single fee. Now, because you've, jo jo because you've joined me today, 
Um, and if you want to do that, if you just make a note of that discount code, Web 10 20 20 20, you'll get an extra 10% off if you buy before Christmas. So that's an extra 100 quid in it. So let's do a quick poll, just a very brief one today. Um, and let's just launch the first question. What is your job role? So are you in architectural? Are you in civil engineering, structural engineering or other? I just want to get an idea of, of who's in the room, so to speak. Good, we're getting lots of votes in. Thank you for that. Oh, it's a really even split today. That's fantastic to see. It's almost exactly split. Oh, it's just diverting a little bit. Right, we've almost all voted now, so I'll close the poll in a second now, and I'll share that with you. So that's good to see. A third of you are architectural, a third of you are civil engineering, a little bit less uh, structural engineering, and uh, some others in there. So we've got a real good um, mixture in there. Okay, so now we know what you're doing. Um, which software do you use? What's your primary software? I know we all use uh, lots of different software. Um, what would you consider your primary software? Hang on, the, the whole thing's gone a bit weird. Minimize that. There you go. Okay, so if you use Revit, just tick on that. Uh, if you use AutoCAD, that includes the verticals, so things like Map 3D, Civil um, PNID, Architecture, stick it in there. Who uses Civil 3D as the primary? Oh, you've almost all voted. Now, oh, no, that is interesting. Okay, right. Let's uh, close that poll now and share that with you. So this is a first for me. Nobody's got Civil 3D as their primary. Oh, no, we have. Somebody clicked at the last minute, a few of you clicked at the last minute. Uh, so very few Civil 3D. So from that being my kind of primary product, that's interesting. So it's great to see other people are on here. Nobody using Infoworks as a primary? Ah, that's probably expected. Um, let's hide that. Let's move on to the next question. What other software do you use? What would you consider your second go-to piece of software? So if you're a Revit user, I would suspect your next most common software would either be Infoworks or, or AutoCAD or a variant of AutoCAD. Um, a few more you're using Civil 3D, which is as a secondary product, that's useful. Quite a few use other software, that's expected as well. Right, okay, uh, you've nearly all voted. I'll close that in a second. I'll close it now and share that with you. Uh, so most of you are using AutoCAD as a secondary product, which is brilliant. You know, go back 10 years, that would, that would be completely reversed, um, which is fantastic to see. So yeah, so thank you for that. I'll hide that. Okay, let's just uh, get an idea of how long you've been using your primary software. So are you new to using Revit or AutoCAD? Have you been using it less than a year? Have you been using it between one and five years? Maybe you've been using it quite a while, between five and ten? Or it's just so long you can't remember or don't care to remember. Anything above ten years, basically. Uh, just plonk your, your, your one in there. Okay, you've nearly all voted you left okay that's great to see so thank you for that i'll share that with you so uh nobody's new to it which is great um so the most of you have been between five and ten years and there's a load of you that have just been using this forever it seems brilliant thank you for that really interesting okay let's carry on uh with the webinar can you see that you can Okay, so the, it, we'll just go through the agenda and, and where matters, right? And it, it certainly does when you're trying to coordinate your models uh, to get all of the different disciplines to talk to each other in the same language when it comes to position and scale can sometimes get a little bit tricky. So putting a Revit model into Civil 3D, for example, sometimes it lands in the right place, sometimes it's a little off. Occasionally it's so far away you can't even find it. We're going to start by explaining all of the coordinate systems that you have in AutoCAD, in Revit, also Infoworks as well. I've added that one to the list. Then I'm going to explain geographical coordinates because this is the cause of most problems users are having when they coordinate their models. Apparently size matters, so I'm told. Um, sometimes it comes in at the right scale, sometimes it's massive or tiny. 
you know, the big question I hear people say is, why is it not simple? Why don't they all just use the same coordinate systems and scale? All will become clear. And the, with whatever time we have left, I will show you a few workflows to make your life a little bit easier, okay? I think if you have a deeper understanding of what things are, and more importantly, why things are, you will come across less problems and when you have an issue, you'll be able to resolve it quickly. That is the point of this webinar. So let's start with Revit. So Revit uses Cartesian coordinates. Now Cartesian coordinates, for those that don't recognize the term, are a set of numbers that represent a point on a plane perpendicular to the origin. This is an important differentiator later on in the webinar, as you will see. There are three Cartesian coordinates within a Revit project the internal coordinate system, the project coordinate system, and the shared coordinate system. There's also two reference points that are just the coordinate systems and help represent them geographically. These are the project base point and the survey point. So the internal coordinate system provides a framework for all model elements placed in the project. It also provides context for the project and the shared coordinate system. The origin of the internal coordinate system is used when you link Revit models using the origin to origin positioning. You can also place spot coordinates relative to the internal coordinate system as well. Now the project coordinate system, that is available to establish a convenient coordinate system for the specific project. In other words, you could place the origin on the corner of a building and have the coordinate system orthogonal to the building. So that helps you with the modeling process. The shared coordinate system is available to match the Revit project to real world coordinates. So this could come from a survey, for example. Essentially, the coordinate systems are designed so that you can establish a shared coordinate system based on the real world location, or you could use that for a convenient um, intersection on two property lines for, our, uh, for argument's sake. But then you can set the project coordinate system at the origin at a convenient location for the project, like the corner of a building. And there are also true north and project north positions in, in Revit. So the true north is a positive y direction of the shared coordinate system, while the project north is a positive y, y direction of the project coordinate systems. Let's move on to AutoCAD. Now, AutoCAD also uses Cartesian coordinate systems, but there's only one. And you adjust the UCS position to match your current task. And given how many of you have been using AutoCAD for uh, a while now, I'm sure you're all pretty much aware of that. Now, if you have AutoCAD, so if you are an AutoCAD user and you want to work on real world coordinates, so if you're using InfoWorks for argument's sake as well, then you can use real world coordinates in AutoCAD by downloading the map version. You just download AutoCAD Map 3D instead of AutoCAD, and this has the addition of real world coordinates. It'll cost you nothing over and above your AutoCAD. So my mission is to stop everyone downloading plain vanilla AutoCAD. Just download the version that is relevant to your job. Now, when you're using one of these vertical apps, applications such as AutoCAD Architecture or AutoCAD Map or MEP or PNID, you can set the ribbon to be just like your AutoCAD. So there's no worries. You just carry on working just as you have done in AutoCAD, but you'll have additional functions to help you do your job. And in our case, it's AutoCAD Map 3D because that has two coordinate systems, the standard AutoCAD Cartesian coordinate system and the addition of the geographical coordinate system. Now it's worth explaining what a geographical coordinate system is, as this is the basis of most misunderstandings when it comes to combining data from different disciplines. So I'll get to that after we've, we've had a look at the other products in the list. Civil 3D. Civil 3D has all the functionality of AutoCAD map. So it has the same two coordinate systems, AutoCAD, our Cartesian coordinate and the geographical coordinate system. So if I'm working in uh, real world coordinates in AutoCAD Map 3D a little bit later on maybe, um, just note that if I'm doing it in Map 3D, all you civil users can uh, do that as well, okay? InfoWorks, this has 
Uh, it just uses one quote. Well, it uses two systems, but one system, geographical coordinates. But there are two settings for that, one for the database and one for the UCS. You have to set the database coordinates when you make your model. Now, if you're using Model Builder from version 2021.1 onwards, you also have to set the database coordinate system. If you're using 2021.0 or earlier, when you use the Model Builder, it automatically sets the coordinate to WGS84. If you don't know what that means, don't worry, a full explanation is on its way. Once you've created your model in InfoWorks, you cannot change the coordinates at all. The database coordinates are fixed. The other coordinates, the UCS coordinates, these can be adjusted at any time and they're just for the display purposes. Basically, it's them three numbers at the bottom left of the display that represent where your mouse is currently in the model. So let's explain geographical coordinates. If you understand these, you will understand why we have different systems and why you might be having some problems lining things up when you bring your Revit models into InfoWorks or your map data into Revit. We're all familiar with the standard Cartesian coordinates in AutoCAD and Revit. These are the three numbers that you use to represent a position on a plane. So if we draw something in AutoCAD or Revit, we could represent the object using three numbers. So point B, for example, could be uh, represented by 0, 0, 0, and point A by 5, 15, 0, etc. Now, with our triangle, we can do some calculations, can't we? The maths for this was devised in the 4th century BC by you, the mathematician Euclid. So you could say it's well established. Now, Euclid stated that the sum of the three angles of any triangle will always equal 180 degrees. This is true on a flat surface. But what happens when you put this on the surface of a sphere? our Euclidean mathematics starts to break down. The angles no longer add up to 180 degrees. We have to find the proportion of the sphere covered by the triangle, and then plug in this maths, A plus B plus C equals 180 degrees times one plus four times the proportion of the sphere. It's a little bit more complicated. Now let's take this a little bit further with Pythagoras' theorem. In the flatland of Euclid, we can calculate the distance between two points using this formula a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So let's say you're at point A and you want to know how far away point B is. We'll call this C. If we take a vector to the origin, we get a right hand angled triangle and we can calculate the distance using the formula. So you want to know what C is, just take the coordinates of A and B to calculate it. So let's say for argument's sake, A is at 0, 5 and B is at 5, 0. This will make the length of A five units and the length of B also five units. So our formula will be five squared plus five squared equals our distance squared. Let's carry that through. Five squared is 25. So 50 equals our distance squared. Therefore, the square root of 50 is our distance. So our distance is 7.07. .07. So why am I giving you this maths lesson? Well, in Cartesian coordinates, that's how your AutoCAD and Revit works out distances. Looking from a vantage point directly above the line, uh, if you're straight looking straight down from a top view, uh, the line using the delta values in Euclidean geometry, it will appear to be correct. The length of that line will appear to be correct. However, what happens when you put this distance vector onto a curved surface. On a curved surface, it would either be floating in the air, or if we laid it on the surface, Pythagoras' theorem would also break down. The length of C would be greater than 7.07. .07. So let's consider that in the real world. We want to know how long the Thames barrier is. We can do that in AutoCAD using delta X and delta Y, and that's a simple calculation. You just take the coordinates and find the difference between them. So here's the Thames barrier. How long is it? Let's have a look at the properties and just plug in the numbers. Here is the X and Y coordinates. We just need to take the start X and the end X, find the difference between them, and do the same for Y. 
This gives me the delta x and the delta y. Then just continue with the equation, and hey presto, you get a length. So that is the length of the Thames Barrier using AutoCAD, using the standard mathematics we have used for centuries. All makes sense so far, hopefully. Well, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news to some of you, but the shocking truth is that the Earth is not flat. If you want to be more accurate, it's an oblate spheroid. So clearly, our Euclidean mathematics do not work in the real world. We cannot use Pythagoras' theorem to work out lengths. We have to be a little bit cleverer than that. Yes, the difference at the scale of a building is, is quite negligible, and you tend to build them on a flat platform anyway. That's why you get away with it. But the difference for the Thames barrier is significant. More for the M6 or imagine HS2. It's going to be a huge difference, and I'll show you that later on. If you design the HS2 in AutoCAD, when it came to lay out in the real world on the Earth's surface, you will fall short of Manchester by some distance. You might have to get out at Stockport and walk the rest. So that is the why we do what we do. Let's have a look at how we do what we do. This is all part of that deeper understanding required to get things right and to allow us to manage our models better. And more importantly, when things do go wrong, understand what has gone wrong, why it's gone wrong, and put it right. So let's consider a spherical coordinate system. The coordinate is defined with a horizontal and vertical number along two axes, one north to south, one east to west. In order to be unambiguous about the direction of the coordinates, map makers choose a reference ellipsoid with an origin called a geodetic datum. A good example of a world coordinate system is WGS. That stands for World Geodetic System. The latest iteration of that is WGS84. We've heard that already once today. Uh, this is used in many applications, including your GPS in your car and also Google Maps. Now, WGS84 uses a geodetic datum around the equator and a vertical line called the prime meridian north to south. The coordinates are measured in um, latitude, north to south, and longitude, east to west. So the position of the, share, the shard in London can be described as 51 degrees 30, 15, uh, 50, 51 degrees 30 minutes, 15.8 seconds north, that's the latitude, and 0 degrees 5 minutes, 11.5 seconds west, longitude. Sometimes these are converted to decimal degrees, so the shard's position can also be 51.5 north and 0 0.08 west. Now we measure it using degrees, minutes and seconds because it's the most convenient way to describe a circle, i.e. a fraction of 360 degrees. Now one arc second is about 30 metres. If you've got your calculator out and divide the Earth's circumference around the equator, which is a shade over 40 kilometres, if you divide that by 360 degrees, then divide the result by 60 minutes, and then divide it by 60 seconds, you'll see that the distance is a little over 30 metres. The origin of WGS84, so 0 degrees latitude and 0 degrees longitude, is located just off the coast of West Africa in the Atlantic Ocean. It's actually marked by a buoy. Uh, you can find that in Google Maps now. You just type 0, 0 in the search engine. Uh, you might also find there things that Google users have positioned incorrectly. And if you use any location-based application, when the software doesn't know where you are, it will often place you there. So if your model or drawing has no geographical coordinates on it, you put it into something that has got geographical coordinates like InfoWorks on WGS84, that is where you'll find your model. Now this is all well and good. However, since maps were invented, we've always displayed them on a flat surface, such as a paper map or more relevantly to us in AutoCAD. This is where a projection is needed. The ability to project a sphere onto a flat surface is not an unsurmountable task, but it's not as simple as it sounds, and there are many options used in many different ways. Firstly, you have to decide how to project your map. We can do a cylindrical projection, a conical projection, or a planar projection. 
Projections can protect certain properties, but they have to sacrifice others. So when you project a severe spherical object onto a flat surface, you have to choose what to preserve and what to sacrifice. And your options are angle, area, or distance. So you can maintain angle at the cost of area and distance, or you can make preserve area at the cost of angle and distance, etc. Uh, and you, there's varying degrees of that um, uh, accuracy, if you like, within them three um, uh, projections. So let's take the most familiar of the mapping programs you come across, Google Maps. Now this uses a projection called the Mercator projection when you've got the globe view switched off. The Mercator projection is a cylindrical map projection created by a chap called Gerardus Mercator in 1569. Now it became the standard map projection for navigation because it maintains angles. It was preferred in marine navigation way back when because ships can sail in a, at a constant bearing for long stretches. You could say linear scale is constant on the Mercator in every direction around a point. It preserves the angles, but not the area or distance. So imagine you're traveling to Florida on your holiday. It would be a lot easier to navigate in a straight line than on a curved surface. On a straight line, we can choose a constant bearing and get to our destination. Now this is not the case on a sphere, as we, the line would have to be curved. Now, because the Mercator projection preserves angle, it sacrifices area and distance. Um, Mer Mercator, he was European, so he's preserved the central region of the map as much as possible and let the extremities lose their area and length. So it inflates the sizes of objects away from the equator. So this is why in a Mercator map, Greenland appears far larger than it actually is relative to land masses near the equator, such as Africa or Central Africa. So here's Greenland on the Mercator. And if I move that line over to Africa, you'll see it's a shade over the size of Africa. This is not true. In reality, Africa is over 14 times larger in surface area than Greenland. Now I've used Google Maps to demonstrate a projection because Google uses WGS84 and the Mercator projection. Uh, the reason why they do that, the advantage they had in using that projection was it allowed them to show streets in Google Maps in straight lines, remembering that the, the USA uses a grid system for their city layout and it's rather large. There's a variant of the Mercator called the Transverse Mercator. So you may have come across a UTM coordinate. That stands for Universal Transverse Mercator. And this divides the Earth into 60 zones and projects each onto a plane as a basis of their coordinates. The British Isles, we're on UTM zone 29 to 31. In the UK, we use a system called the British National Grid, the BNG. Now the grid is based on a coordinate zone OSGB 36 datum, which is in turn based on the Airy 1830 ellipsoid projection. Now, I'm not going to go down that particular rabbit hole, but basically not come or not, it's just off the Scilly Isles west of Cornwall. So if your drawing is on the British National Grid and your Revit model is not, and it's got no coordinates on it, and you pop it all into InfoWorks, that is where you'll find your Revit model. Uh, the grid travels 700 kilometers east and 1300 kilometers north. Uh, now, not coming out is actually called the false origin. That's why it says in there the false origin. The true origin is just uh, near Jersey. Uh, if you were looking at it in WGS 84, it's at 40 degrees north, 2 degrees west. But the Ordnance Survey moved it to a false origin, um, uh, basically to eliminate negative numbers. So all our British national grids are positive numbers. Okay, for Ireland, You've got your own Irish national grid, the ING, and that is based on the Irish Transverse Mercator, ITM. For Northern Ireland, we often find the data on the ITM coordinate, but sometimes data is produced on an extended British national grid to make it easier to merge with other UK national data sets. I think I find it on the ITN more than anything, though. Let's just go back to the Thames barrier and have a look at the real length of that line that I drew but this time on the British National Grid. So the C on, um, uh, in AutoCAD was 
The distance on the British National Grid is 0.926, so it's an 80 millimeter difference. Not massive, but that is big enough to cause you a fabrication issue. Now imagine that on the road that's 10 miles long, or indeed on HS2, it becomes a huge significance, and I'm gonna show you that in a moment when I fire up AutoCAD. Size, size also matters apparently. So units in Revit for the UK market is almost always in millimeters. It's based around the internal coordinates. With Civil 3D and Map 3D using geographical coordinates, these are in meters, and they're usually based around that false origin of the British National Grid for the UK market. It is never a good idea to make any AutoCAD or Revit model a long way from the origin. So what that means is that your AutoCAD models will have to remain with the unit set to meters at all times. If you do convert them to millimeters, which I know you can, but the numbers will be just too big. Instead of working in hundreds of thousands, you'll be working in hundreds of millions, and no one wants that. Additionally, one of the main benefits of using AutoCAD Map 3D, and of course Civil 3D, oh, and InfoWorks over AutoCAD and Revit, is you can connect and insert data from all manner of providers, such as the Ordnance Survey, or DEFRA, the Environment Agency, the uh, British Geological Survey. There's, there's hundreds of uh, people out there producing data on this level of scale. All of these organizations provide their data on the British National Grid in meters. Some of these data, data sets, they're massive, they're really large. If you try and convert them really large data set into millimeters, you will head into a whole heap of trouble. Do not do it. In AutoCAD, if you've set the insertion units correctly, when inserting a drawing with the units set to millimeters into a drawing where the units are set to meters and vice versa, Auto, AutoCAD will automatically scale the inserted drawing. So you don't have to do anything. With Revit, these units are set to millimeters. And again, if you bring a meters drawing into a Revit, it will automatically scale it accordingly. So as I'm sure you're all aware, and if not before, you are now, we don't really need to think about units. As long as you set them correctly at the start, if you have a drawing in millimeters, you insert it into a drawing in meters, it'll recognize that. It'll automatically scale the inserted drawing around the origin. Civil 3D users, there's an additional setting that you have to change. So, uh, well, if you're using the, the UK IE country kit, so if those of you that are using Civil 3D as a secondary product, are probably not aware of this, you need to download and install the UK IE country kit. That's the UK and Ireland country kit. Uh, you've got some additional settings. They're already set up if you've got the country kit, but they're not if you're not using the country kit. So if, you've just, if you're just using civil metric, this will be set up um, not correctly. Well, it'll be in meters, but there'll be other problems. Always use the UK, i.e. country kit. Uh, so you go into the tool space settings, and uh, um, this, this, this setting here is for the civil elements. So alignments are in meters, not in feet, as they are for the US market. Infoworks always in meters, okay? Well, for most markets, obviously the US are in feet, but um, uh, for all of Europe and most of the world, uh, they're in metrics. It's always in uh, meters. You set these in the application menus. Uh, so for those of you working uh, in metric, just leave it on meters. Yes, you can set it to millimeters, but all the data you're using is in meters. So stick with that nothing bad will happen. When you insert a Revit model, which is in millimeters, just like with AutoCAD, InfoWorks will scale it correctly. You don't have to worry about it. So let's just put that into practice. Let's just do something. Let's get some civil models and Revit models and InfoWorks models, and, and we'll end up sticking them into Navisworks, and they should all line up nice and correctly. It's not going to be a kind of single workflow that I'm going to be showing you here. I'll just do lots of things um, and we'll just see how we get on. Okay. Right. Let's cancel that. And let's just start with that geodetic distance. Okay. So I've drawn a line in AutoCAD here, which is 250 kilometers long. So it's 250,000 units because the units of my drawing is meters. 
I've drawn another one here, which is 550,000 units. So basically London to Edinburgh or London to Manchester, okay? Now, if I use my inquiry tool here for a point, oops, where did you go? And I just set point number one, let's just move that over a bit. So you can see both. And I set point number one, which is London, and point number two, which is Manchester, we can see that the horizontal distance, there it is, 250,000 units, but the geodetic distance, the distance on the British national grid is 250,082.703 meters. That's 82 meters longer on the British national grid than it is in AutoCAD. So bear that in mind, that's a significant difference. If I went to Edinburgh, it's 188 meters. So it's a significant difference. So you've just got to be aware that is why we're using um, the uh, British National Grid. Okay, um, HS2, by the way, if any of you are working on HS2, that uses a different grid system called the Snake Grid, designed for long linear structures. Uh, just search Snake Grid and you'll see it. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, what we've got. So I've got a civil model here. And in here, I've got a surface. So we've created a surface for our civil model. There it is. And on there, I've got my AutoCAD entity. So I've got my AutoCAD map stuff in there. If I uh, turn off the map, uh, turn on the map, you can see there. Uh, and I've got uh, the position of a Revit model in here, all set up in Civil 3D. Wouldn't it be lovely if I can just use that surface in Revit? So I've got the uh, surface in Revit. So that's what we'll do. Uh, in AutoCAD, I've just got it all laid out in 2D. Okay, so I've just got all the mapping stuff in 2D. Again, note the units are in meters. You can see them in here. Um, if you want to change the geographical coordinates, uh, you can type in a command, map CS stands for coordinate system, assign. Actually, in Map 3D, you can uh, click on this thing here. And this will open up the coordinate system. And you can see Map 3D and Civil 3D has hundreds and hundreds of coordinate systems. So although it can look like AutoCAD, as this does, I've turned it to the 2D drafting workspace, I've got this addition. So I can now work on the British National Grid or any coordinate system that I want. Uh, if you want to find it, you just type in OSGB, OSGB in the search and there it is british national grid so you can set the coordinates to the british national grid everything works um revit i have my revit model here let's just open up the site plan while i'm at it i'll open up the 3d model this is our office in shipley if any of you have been there So there's my 3D model. If I go to the site plan and just look at the coordinates, they've not been set. Not comma not comma not. If I just tab, there we are. There's the survey point. Not comma not comma not. So they've not been set in the Revit model. Um, it's just as it is. Okay. What else have we got? I've got an InfoWorks model of the site. So we've, uh, we've done some preliminary work. That is what we want our site to look like. So we could use all this stuff. Now look at the coordinates down the bottom left. This is on the British National Grid. Um, if I go to the, no, I didn't want that, properties. You'll see it's on the uh, British National Grid. And the coordinate system for the database is also on the British National Grid. You can't change that. I can only just change the UCS coordinates. So maybe I want to use all that stuff as well. So we can output that in uh, and put that into, um, InfoWorks, uh, into uh, Navisworks. Let's start with Revit. Uh, first things first, let's get the coordinates from Revit and we'll extract them out of Civil. So we know where it's going to be here. Let's put that into Revit. Um, so if I just set my layer state to geolocation, okay, so it just makes life easier. That's the building. There's a, an add-on you can download in the toolbox. You download it for Civil 3D and it's called the Autodesk Shared Reference Point. You then go to your Revit downloads, and there's one in there for the Revit as well, and that will import this. 
So this allows me to share my coordinates with Sybil and Revit, so everything will line up. So I'll just double click that. It says pick a point. I'll just pick the corner of the building there. And then I'll say that is my project north, back of the building. And it gives me these coordinates here. So I'll just OK that and save it. So I uh, didn't want to put it in there. Oh, let's see where I'm going to put it. Let's go in here. Uh, work webinars. So I've already got one there. I'll put this one as number two. Number two. Okay, so that's my coordinates in Civil. Let's go and apply that to Revit. So we go to our add-ins because we've added it in. There it is, import shared coordinates. So you download that and pick them same two points. So I'm going to say that that is the base point and that is the quasi north. And then I'll go and pick that Keyside, uh, Keyside location to the one I've just made. And it says you're about to create a new coordinate system. So I'll say yes. It's done. Now, if I go to the Manage tab and Location, on the Site tab, you'll see there's two coordinates now. I've got the internal, but I've also got a shared coordinate. So I'm going to make that one current. Hit OK. So if I pick this coordinate now, you'll see that it's got these coordinates on it. Note it knows to scale it correctly. So in Civil, it was 925166. 925166. Um, and it's automatically moved the decimal place for me. Okay. Uh, if I was to change that to true north, we should see it rotate as well. Okay. Let's compare that to my AutoCAD drawing. There's the AutoCAD. That's where I decided it was going to be. And that's where it is now. So we have shared our coordinate system. Okay. So that's. Um, setting the coordinate system on Revit. Let's share the surface in there. Okay. Yeah, let's share the surface in here as well. Okay. So in my civil drawing, I'll just go back to my uh, working layer state. We have this surface here, okay? Um, there is some collaboration tools where I can publish this surface. So this just requires a BIM 360 Docs account. And all you do is you tell it where you're going to publish it, the surface. Now it'll take about three or four minutes to publish it, update it, and then rev it to bring it down. So I have done one earlier. That's the one I actually did that one last night. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, I did that one last night. So I'll, I'll pick that one. Okay. And I'll share with that one. So you just click save. Uh, I will call this one. I'll leave it running in the background. You'll see it appear, but I'll use number two. And I hit OK. And we're now publishing this surface. You always get this message because basically I'm showing it as contours. Uh, Revit needs to see it as triangles. And it'll, you, you just say publish the surface with the updated style. Okay, it won't change this drawing, but it'll change it in the published drawing. So that's going to use BIM 360, store that surface. I can then go into Revit. Um, and in, uh, blah, 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 in Revit, I'll just link to it. So if I go to the Insert tab, Link Topography, that will go to the same BIM 360 area. Find all the files. You can see the three hasn't appeared yet because it's being uploaded now, but I'm online using video and all sorts. So, But I'll pick the one that I did last night and I'll link to that. And it will say you've got geographical coordinates on there. In a second, got my little egg timer. There it is. So I'm going to align using the links world coordinate and the shared coordinate. Okay, so I'll do that. Boom. So my civil model on the British National Grid and my Revit model are now in the same place. Rather nice. 
We can do the same with AutoCAD. So let's go to the site again. So there's my site. Okay. And let's link to our AutoCAD drawing. Remember, our AutoCAD drawing is on the British National Grid. Look at them coordinates. Big numbers, units, set to meters. I want to share this drawing. I want to put that in my Revit model. So I'll just link CAD. I'll go and find that model. Uh, is it in map or AutoCAD? Oh, there it is. Line map on the British National Grid. So all I need to do is not correct lines that are off axes because it's a map. So we don't want to do that. Uh, we'll do it uh, auto by shared coordinates and we won't orientate to the current view and we'll stick it at level zero. Hit OK. And my map now lands in the same place as my Revit model. Remember my model is in millimeters and I've got a coordinate system that I can do orthogonal to the building, etc. So I've got that coordinate system that's convenient for modeling the building. I've got the internal coordinate system, which is um, a framework for everything. But the shared coordinate system can do all that. Share the surface and share the map as well. So we can set it up however we want to set it up. Cool. OK, so that's that. Now, what else can we do? So InfoWorks here on the British National Grid as well. Let's stick everything into Navisworks, okay? Let's go and open up Navisworks. So what will we start with? Let's start with um, the civil model. Let's bring in, I just append that. Uh, it's gonna be a autogo. We'll bring in the surface first. So let's find that, civil 3D. I've got one there just of the surface. Just use data shortcut. So there we are, there's the surface. So that's um, on the British National Grid, isn't it? Um, let's now bring in the Revit model. Okay, so let's go up a level, find our Revit model. I need to change it to Revit, don't we? Revit. There's the one that's located on the British National Grid. Should land in the right place. Give it a second. Boom, there it is, perfect. What else we got? Well, I've got that InfoWorks model, haven't I? So I've exported all of that as um, an FBX file. So we're just gonna append that as well. Um, I've got the surface in there as well. So I'll just hide the civil one for now, just so that it all comes in in the right place. Uh, so that's under shared Info, InfoWorks exports. There they all are. So I need to change that to FBX. And I can just bring them all in in one go. They should all land in the right place as well. Excellent. Oh, no materials. So, uh, viewpoint, put some lighting on it. There's the materials. So very simple to get all of these items to land in the right place for use in Navisworks, for putting AutoCAD stuff into Revit, for putting Civil stuff into Revit, for putting Revel Revit stuff into um, Navisworks, all linked all with the correct coordinates for the discipline that they're using. Uh, okay, so that hopefully was uh, a useful explanation of all the different types of coordinates. Uh, this has been recorded, so it will be online later on if you want to view it later on. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to stick them in the questions box now. It's been unusually quiet today. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think that's a good thing. I've been very clear um, is how I'll take that. Um, but please, yeah, feel free to ask any questions. Sometimes you go away from these things and you think, um, you know, half an hour, an hour down the line, oh, I should have asked that. Feel free to send in an email later on uh, and ask any questions that you have. Oh, here we are. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, welcome. Oh, Ian Robinson. Thank you. Uh, another Ian. My mum wouldn't spell I'm from my mum's from Glasgow and she wouldn't spell it that way. That's why mine's I A N. Don't know why. Um, yeah, so thank you very much indeed. Thanks for watching and uh, hopefully have a great day. And I'll see you next week for Super Elevations if you're interested. Any of the Civil 3D. Thank you.